body to be used for God's good purpose. Yeah. So let's bring that back around to the churches to wrap it up. Yeah. Because I've had this conversation actually a number of times just in the past month of people texting me or emailing me or calling me to say, my pastor uh, is not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gifts aren't there every Sunday. And as far as pastoral care goes, I can't really talk to him about what is afflicting my conscience in regards to the mandates, for example, at work. Or he refuses to talk to me about a religious exemption. Or when I bring it up, he tells me that's not loving my neighbor. It's not being faithful to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And the the overwhelming uh, kind of sense of and thesis is, so I just do my best. And I just remember he's my pastor and, and I got to pray for him. And I'm like, no, no, no. If he's not preaching the gospel and he's not making the gifts of salvation a priority, and he's not ministering to you, he's not shepherding you, when your conscience is afflicted, he's not being your pastor. No. And sitting around and waiting for him to change isn't going to change anything. Speak the truth, and if he doesn't listen, kick the dirt off your feet and go find a pastor who will preach the gospel to you, give you the gifts, and minister to you. It's like it's like his conscience is going to be informed just naturally without you actually saying anything to it. Right. Right. He, needs, yes. a, he needs that yeah. conscience. You risk yeah. being ostracized by your church. Correct. You risk being vilified by not just the pastor, but perhaps by your family and friends within the church. Mm-hmm. But ask yourself, like I said earlier, when you're labeled an extremist for demanding that the gospel of Jesus Christ be preached consistently, that the gifts be there regularly, even if it's not every week, at least every other week, or your pastor is saying to you, if you need the sacrament weekly, I will bring it to you, or you can come to church and I'll give it to you weekly if mm-hmm. you need it. And you come to me and say, I need it, I'll give it to you. If your pastor is not doing that, he is not ministering to you. He's not pastoring to you. And if your congregation, your family, friends, or otherwise, label you as an extremist or a troublemaker, or make you think you're the only person in that church who's asking these questions or putting, you know, making a fuss about it. Right kick the dirt off your feet, you're not losing anything. You're losing oppression. You're losing your voice being silenced for demanding the gospel be preached. Yeah. But Jesus' directive to us is very, very clear. But this, I mean, this, that's the language of this, of this book. You're living a lie. Correct. You keep telling yourself this is God's church, this is Christian preaching, yeah. and it's not. No. Now, I mean, you could do something about that if you believe the person... Is, does want to be a faithful preacher of God's word, then you call him to repentance. You show him. Or, right. And you can do it You can do it with the questions, right? I mean, sure. yeah. maybe I think most pastors aren't going to re- respond well to the full, you know, frontal attack. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? But you say, you know, I, I listened to your sermon on Sunday and um, I was trying to figure out, like, how would you, where's Jesus, you know, how does he fit into this? Right. <laughs> you know, uh, did, you know, did Jesus, uh, you don't want to be too offensive. I was going to say, did Jesus have to die for your sermon to be true? Right. I love that diagnostic. Mm-hmm. I try to apply it to my own sermon, but, um, right. you know, they may not respond as well to that. But it's like, well, uh, you know, where's this written? I think is a good question too, right? Right. I need more scripture here. I need to understand where, what basis, you know, you're coming to from this. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I better understand, we can better understand each other. And, may, right. and maybe he sees, like, I don't really know why I said what I said. I don't know right. why I believe what I believe. Romans 13, you know, do whatever the state tells you to do. I'm like, is that really what it says? You know? No. Can't go back. You forgot the comma. <laughs> yeah. There's still that thing about God. Well, if, if, here's my, I pointed this out on Facebook today. I love just kind of like triggering people. So that's what I use it for. Isn't that what you're supposed to use it for? I think so. Sure. Um, just say, well, look, if, if uh, Romans 13 teaches that the state was uh, established by God, then it has to be governed by God's word. Correct. And if it's not being governed by God's word, it's no longer operating according to God's establishment. Exactly. I was like, what? It's pretty simple. But, oh, you mean he, he wouldn't establish a state that operates according to its own law? No. No. <laughs> Again, go read the history of Israel. He establishes many governments and tears many governments down for rebelling against his word. Go read uh, the reforms of Hezekiah. Right. So that's how you understand we must obey God rather than men is right. to say, well, if they're not operating according to God's mandate, then... Huh. Right. Uh, and here's some guidelines for the proclamation of the gospel as I was taught them. These are, yes. we used to call them rules for proclaimers, but that was too legalistic. So we took away the, way, the term rules and went, yeah, they're suggestions. Otherwise known as, you must preach this way to preach the gospel. Yeah, uh, okay. One, the gospel is always present tense. Mm-hmm. Two, the gospel is always unconditional. 
Three, Jesus is the subject of all of the verbs of salvation, and you are the direct object that receives the action of the verb. And fourth, it must be for you for the forgiveness of sin. Unconditional, present tense, you're the object that receives the action of Jesus for you for the forgiveness of sin. I know that all seems inherently obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> Not in my experience. Uh, no. The number of churches I've walked out of in the middle of sermons and conferences and retreats. Yeah, it could be any number no. of those things, right? Or more, one or more. It could be not for me, right? Not now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not forgiveness of sins. It's usually it takes place in the past, and it's about Jesus, and then applied to us in the present tense through. Well, now go and do likewise. Obligation, obedience, yeah. And Duty. it switches from Jesus being the subject of the verbs in the past to me being the subject of the verbs in the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it becomes that's not the gospel. It's not even law. It's gospel. It's creamer sermons. Creamer. Half and half. Yeah. Right? It's being gummed to death by a million goldfish. But the law has no bite. It has no traction because it's not being preached lawfully. And the gospel is not evangelical because it's not for you for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I teach my confirmands this to the point where they're militaristic about it. If they don't hear the for you soon enough in the sermon, they'll start looking at me. And they give me that look that I taught them to give me. And their parents are like, why, you know, my kid gets really antsy in the middle of your sermons and starts right. saying, mom, where's the for you? And I'm like, what? I'm like, it's because I taught them. This right. is what's necessary. You need the comfort that the gospel bequeaths to you. And the comfort comes from the for you, for the forgiveness. This is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. What is necessary to believe? The words for you. Yeah. You know, require all Oh, I taught that for the, I always teach that at the intro, the first day of confirmation. That's mm -hmm. the first thing I teach from the preface, but then I go to that, who is worthy and well-prepared to receive the Lord's Supper? Whoever believes these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, because these words for you require all hearts to believe. And again, their parents are convicted because their parents don't believe it. Not it's all for about you. what you memorize. It's all about what you understand. And I just tear them apart. Not for you now. <laughs> Not for Maybe you now, for you but later. it will be in eight months or eight years. And I just tell the parents, okay, since I don't understand, and I've devoted the last 30 years of my life to studying this, why don't yeah. you tell me? Tell me how God is present on all the altars simultaneously, and yet at the right hand of the Father, and yet fills the universe with his presence. Right. And gives to you to eat and drink of his flesh and blood without it being consumed. Without it being consumed, and yet you are consuming it. I'm like, you know what you do with that? You confess it, and you either trust that it's true or not. That's what the word faith means. He is right. worthy and well-prepared who believes... And the word pistis, pistuos, in Greek means to trust. It's a relationship word. Trust in, yes. In it's who? not based on how much you've read. It's not based on what you understand. It's based in the relationship. Do you trust that as your parent, I love you unconditionally? Well, it's, the not, answer trust, of, it's not trust or faith in ideas. It's trust no. or faith in a person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I always compare it to their, their relationship to their parent. Do you love your parents? Yes. Why? I don't know. But you trust that they love you? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Exactly. That's faith. That's yeah. faith. The consistency of God's word in doing what he says he's going to do for you is what creates that trust. So when people ask, like in Romans, is it the faithfulness of Jesus? Is that the translation? Or is it faith in Jesus that's the translation? And the answer is mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, right. God's faithfulness to his promise to you is what creates the faith in you to trust that he's actually God. He acts and then he does the action consistently so that you can say consistently, well, he keeps doing it. So I guess I can trust that he's just gonna keep doing it. Right, and that's what I was gonna say about the parents. I mean, you can, or, or husband and wife, you know, all those other relationships, you can break them <laughs> yeah, by actually. not showing up, right? By yeah. not doing and not, not living according to what you believe. Um, right. But God willing, you know, since we not, mm -hmm. none of us do this perfectly or not in the way of God, Right. Uh, for us in Christ, that that uh, we live in his word right. alongside that relationship so that right. we're hearing the word of forgiveness so we have forgiveness to give to each other. <laughs> right. The only thing yeah. that I know, and I say that no in the sense of trust, the only thing that I know is 100% true is that Jesus died on Friday and rose again on the Sabbath for my justification. And if that's true, then everything else that scripture says can be true too. Because a man died and came back from the dead three days later. And it was mm -hmm. God. 
And if that can be true of God, that he died and rose three days from the dead after that, then everything else can be true too. A donkey Jonah? can preach the gospel, a man can be swallowed by a giant fish, a snake can talk. Like all of that's possible because Jesus died and rose.